Hey folks, Jared here. I've talked about our feed. I'm going to keep talking about it. There are two existing C-Control feeds out there. The current feed is labeled simply C-Control. It includes the phrase SimSex Flagship Podcast in its description. We are working on a new logo, so once that's finished, we'll have a better visual differentiator for you. But it's C-Control, SimSex Flagship Podcast. That's where you want to be. Please subscribe, rate, and review the new feed as well. I'm going to start on a slightly more morose note and take a minute to mourn on behalf of the Sea Control family the passing of James Horn Fisher. If you've ever asked a sailor, what book should I read about the Navy? And the first recommendation you got back wasn't Last Stand of the Tin Can Sailors. One, I'd be shocked, and two, like whatever recommendation you were given is the incorrect one. You should start with Last Stand of the Tin Can Sailors. Uh, James Horn Fisher is an absolute giant in naval circles, and this is no doubt a terrible loss for his friends and family, and we hope they find peace and grace in this time. Uh, today we have Walker Mills in the host chair, and he's got a guest that we had been circling as a must for some time now. It's author Ian Urbina, and he's going to be discussing his book, Outlaw Ocean. Please check out everything Going on over at the main website, simsec.org, we've partnered with Transcom for a call for articles related to strategic sea lift. If you want to get your ID in front of some flag officers, this is your chance. For more information, check out our website, simsec.org. Finally, I want to take the opportunity to recommend our partners in the Simsec Podcast Network, the Bilge Pumps. You can find Alex, Jamie, Drac, and a pile of iron brew bottles wherever you download your podcasts. On that note, I'll turn it over to Kimber's men. You're listening to Sea Control, hosted by the Center for International Maritime Security. Welcome back aboard the Sea Control podcast from the Center for International Maritime Security. This week, we're talking with Ian Urbina, a Pulitzer Prize winning investigative reporter about his recent essay in The New Yorker, The Smell of Money, and his book, The Outlaw Ocean, Journeys Across the Last Untamed Frontier. Welcome aboard, Ian. Can you go ahead and introduce yourself to our listeners? I'm a journalist. I'm based in Washington, D.C., 20 years at the New York Times, about a year ago left and created my own journalistic nonprofit. And we focus on stories about human rights, labor and environmental crimes at sea around the world. Before we start, I'd like to remind our listeners that our opinions presented here are are solely our own and should not be taken uh, as representative of any of the institutions that we're uh, associated with, but that probably applies more uh, more to me than it, than it does to you uh, employed independently. So Ian, I, I know you're working on a ton of stuff right now, um, but I want to start by talking about uh, your essay in the, in the New Yorker, The Smell of Money. Um, it's not published yet, but you were kind enough to, uh, kind enough to give us uh, an advanced copy. And, and by the time this podcast is out, it will be published and we'll make sure that we put a link to it on our page. But can you tell us about the essay and, and, and what's the story you're telling? Yeah, I mean, on the broadest level, this is a look at this thing called fish meal, which anyone who eats seafood probably is eating but doesn't know it. And at root, what fish meal is, is um, supplement. You know, it's a, these are high protein pellets that historically were derived for the purpose of feeding livestock to fatten them up faster. Uh, so chicken, pigs, and and also aquaculture, so fish farms, Um, rely heavily on fish meal. A decade ago, soy was used as the method for beefing up, fattening up livestock to get them to market sooner. But then soy got more expensive and it became cheaper to use fish meal, which is essentially wild caught fish. So fish at sea that are netted in huge quantities. Typically the target fish for fish meal are fish that otherwise wouldn't be consumed by humans directly because they're too small or bitter or difficult to process. But if you net them in large quantities and grind them up and pelletize them, then that is a robust market and that gets shipped around to, you know, big agro uh, all around the world. And one of the biggest users of fish meal are aquaculture or fish farms, which is a distinct curiosity or irony, if you will, because Aquaculture and fish farms historically were meant to slow the rate of ocean depletion, to slow down how fast the fish were disappearing at sea. And the thought was, well, if we raise these fish in on land or near shore pens, then we don't have to take them out of the sea and we can allow the fish stocks to replenish. So the very core motive of aquaculture was to slow 
ocean depletion. And yet by feeding the aquaculture fish, fish meal, you're actually accelerating ocean depletion because fish meal comes from wild caught fish. So that's sort of the dark irony that I was looking to unpack. And, and this story took me to the coast of West Africa, specifically Gambia, to sort of look at how it plays out in a real world way. Right. And I, I remember being kind of surprised by that because I, you know, I had a, a friend who asked me once when I was getting interested in, in IUU fishing, you know, well, why don't we just fish farm? Why don't we just do aquaculture? And, and I didn't realize I didn't actually know. But your, your essay kind of made that really clear why that's not, it, it could be useful in some uh, circumstances, but why it's not really a silver bullet. Yeah, I mean, I, I would just add to your point there that many of the problems that have emerged with aquaculture are the very same problems that emerged with big agriculture. You know, so when we began taking pigs and chickens and cattle and in huge industrial scale penning them, we ran into, we, the, the sort of Western market especially, ran into certain categories of problems. One was, what do you do with the waste? You put that many cattle in a small area, they produce a lot of waste product. That waste product has methane emissions. That waste product has runoff concerns. That waste product has health concerns for the cattle. What do you do about that? And that's one category of concern that just like with cattle, you see with fish farms, right? You put that many fish in one tight pen, even if the pen is a mile around and it's in near shore, not on land. So there's, you know, cross currents you still have this insane amount of waste being produced and that causes real health concerns for the fish and therefore a reliance on antibiotics, which has downstream food concerns, but it also has environmental concerns because that, you know, concentration of, you know, waste is not good for other species and the shore and whatnot. So um, it's very interesting just to see how big agro, if you will, has run into big agro problems offshore and in water um, much like it did on land with, with, um, you know, um, cattle, pigs and chicken. And so how did you end up in, in Gambia then? I mean, so you've got this big story and, uh, you know, I hope I'm, I'm correct in assuming that this is happening, not just in, in Gambia, but it's kind of happening all over the world. Why did you pick there that you want to kind of show this story and, and tell that story of that one, one fish plant, one fish meal plant in, in one town? Yeah, I mean, it's a really good question. West Africa in general and Gambia in specific interested me because it's kind of the front edge of this market. It's where in the last five years, you've seen the fastest growth in these sorts of plants. So in Mauritania, Senegal and Gambia, in those three countries, you have 14 fish meal plants, almost all of them Chinese owned, that have emerged within the last decade. And that's a huge industrial blossoming, if you will, for very small, very poor developing nations. It has major implications, positive and negative, for the local economies, right? And so since you were seeing a lot of key big industrial fishing companies and fish meal players move into West Africa, it felt like the freshest outer edge of this issue Gambia is interesting in particular, too, because it's the smallest nation on the African continent, and it has this very complicated sort of uh, moment that it is at now politically, whereby, and it's, it's, it's quite a sort of textbook moment, you know, where you see Latin America and Africa, you know, a, a, a nation, developing nation coming out of a long stint of highly repressive government with a seemingly and probably legitimately new set of democratic players who have grand ambitions to change things, right? For their local population, economically, politically, and every other way. And you give them the benefit of the doubt, they come in, they replace this dictator, and they have lofty goals. And then the realities of debt and foreign capital and sort of political unrest uh, emerge And all of a sudden, things get complicated real fast, right? And so in Gambia, we were at that things get complicated moment where you had foreign capital in the form of Chinese investment. You had industrial players in these these fish meal plants. You had local unrest in the form of 
uh, young men, largely many of them teenagers who were sort of very excited about the ability to do things they couldn't before, protest, write freely in the press, et cetera, you know, say what they think politically. And they were taking adv full advantage of that, putting a lot of pressure on the government to do a better job at policing the environmental and economic and job issues that these plants were creating, the fishing concerns, the food security concerns. And so you had all this stuff happening and the government's in a tough position in that on the one hand, they want to um, get out of debt and start rebuilding roads and bridges and do all the fundamental things that they need to do, but they don't have the money. And so they're trying to strike deals with players, foreign, many of them to bring in the money, but they're also trying to not lose control. And they're also getting a lot of pressure from their local votership. Uh, they're allowed, they're selling the country. And so this was a very, it's a, you know, it's a test textbook situation uh, that was emerging, but this time it was around Chinese players and fish meal. So for those reasons, I was super attracted to Gambia. Okay, so that, that's really interesting. So it's it, it's more than than you could just say, hey, they've got weak maritime governance or they have weak enforcement of their fisheries. It's kind of a the whole political uh, uh, and, and, and kind of cultural nexus and economics certainly going on in, in Gambia is, is creating a place where this is, this is likely to happen. And I think, like you said, the, the front edge of this kind of uh, over exploitation. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you have like the environmental story, which is a simple story that we discussed of fish meal and aquaculture and, and players in some place that are taking fish out of the water to feed them other fish to sell them to third party countries that's already an interesting story, but then you have it in the context of a developing nation that's trying to sort of move outside of two decades of repression and into a more democratic space. And the aquaculture industry is playing a pretty complicated role in that specific moment politically. Uh, and then you have the food security element, which is a third part, which I haven't talked about, which is there's a specific type of fish in Gambia and West Africa called bonga fish, B-O-N-G-A, which is historically quite plentiful in these waters. You know, it's like a six, nine inch long fish. It's kind of standard fish, but it was so plentiful that for a long time when you went to the market in Gambia um, or Senegal, you often got this for free, you know, uh, and locals would, you know, it was a subsistence fish that was sort of a staple of their diet and a main source of their protein. And all of a sudden, when the fish meal industry came in, it realized, wow, that Gambia, I mean, excuse me, that bonga fish is plentiful, easy to net and ground up and works quite well as fish meal. So let's target that. And so all of a sudden that threw off the economics of bonga so that the local small artisanal wood crap, you know, wood vessel fishermen suddenly had much more incentive to sell their caught bonga, not to the locals to eat, but to the factory to grind and export. And all of a sudden, this caused major food instability in Gambia and other places because the locals were priced out of something that they had relied on for a long time. And th that's another layer of the story that I thought was really interesting. No, I, I, I definitely picked up on that that too. And I, and I think, you know, I'm reminded of other... Uh, uh, kind of anecdotes that I've seen um, where, you know, there's the fish are so, like you're saying, the fish are so plentiful, people are giving them away or the fishermen don't even want them. Um, you know, Mark uh, Kurlansky has a book about the history of cod that comes to mind. Um, you know, I used to live in uh, Monterey, California, and they had a similar thing with sardines, you know, and now there's no fish. Um, yeah. Yeah. So this, <laughs> it's kind of a sad, a sad pattern. Um, and I, I want to clarify, Ian, when were you when were you actually on the ground in in Gambia? Um, and I should make clear to the listeners, it's very clear uh, if you read the essay that you were there physically doing this uh, uh, investigative reporting, um, because I know you spent several years kind of traveling around the world and uh, to different places. Yeah, I mean, so to take three steps back. So what I do is I produce stories under an umbrella concept called the Outlaw Ocean. And I, I live at an organ, a nonprofit journalism outfit that I created called the, the Outlaw Ocean Project. And what that is, is essentially a journalistic nonprofit that produces stories about these sorts of concerns around the world uh, at sea. And it started in the New York Times. So it was a two year series that ran in the New York Times. And then I left there, DiCaprio and Netflix asked if I would 
make a book out of it, go back to sea so that they can make a series out of the book. So I went back to sea for two more years with a photographer, produced the book. And then after the book, I created the nonprofit so that I could keep producing these kinds of stories. And so that's the sort of backdrop of journalistically what what I do. And this is ongoing reporting. You know, we produce about six of these big stories a year. And um, I was on the ground in Gambia uh, in 2019 late, um, and was there with a team. And the goal was, you know, to, to do to the on-land reporting, you know, visit the plants, talk to the locals, kind of t- t- just standard stuff. And then also to do offshore reporting in the form of embedding, as you say, journalistically on a patrol that was occurring off those waters. Gambia, again, another interesting angle on this story, or at least interesting to me, was Gambia, like many nations, um, has the desire and need to police its waters, but not the resources. And so specifically what that means is they don't have the boats and personnel to really patrol their waters. And yet they're giving licenses to Senegalese, Chinese, Taiwanese, South Korean, you name it. And so there are rules on the books that those players, those industrial commercial fishermen are supposed to follow, but Gambia doesn't really have any capacity to enforce them because they don't have the on-water assets. So in comes this conservation group called Sea Shepherd, you know, um, who describe themselves as sort of vigilante conservationists. You know, Sea Shepherd, many people already know, but is sort of a Greenpeace cousin organization, very well financed and, you know, has a bunch of ships. And and in the last three to five years, the Green, uh, excuse me, Sea Shepherd has taken some of its, you know, Navy sized vessels to uh, West Africa and other places, Latin America, to essentially avail their resources to local governments and say, look, we will um, train your your fisheries officers, bring them on board, if authorized by you, do patrols in your waters, and we will help you do boardings of these vessels so that you can inspect them. And that's what I embedded on was one such, initially it was covert, but then it became public a patrol that was occurring off the coast of Gambia with Gambian officers and on Sea Shepherd vessels. Our listeners probably remember um, a couple of weeks ago, we we did an interview with uh, Claude Baraby. Uh, he's a director of the United States Naval Academy Museum um, and teaches at the United States Naval Academy. And he's he's done quite a bit of research on the Sea Shepherd. And, and we had a good conversation about their evolution from a kind of you know, not sure if they're good guys or or, or not to, um, you know, a pretty legitimate organization that's that's supporting maritime enforcement and, and governance in, in these these other countries. How how effective did you feel their approach was? Yeah, I mean, um, I'll be a good journalist here and to sort of do an on the one hand, on the other hand response. Overall, I, I would add it all up to say I do think it adds value. But I think it's it's complicated and um, bipolar, if you will. On the one hand, these nations need help and governments are, are only occasionally able or willing to offer that help, whether it's training, satellite intel, uh, assets, you know, vessels, the like. Those things are often offered by governments, be they Chinese, Australian, American, whomever. Uh, they're often part of a larger geopolitical or commercial self-interest you know, part of a trade deal or something like that. Um, But everyone has self-interest, but it's sporadic at best. It doesn't really add up to a a consistent way for coastal developing nations to figure out how to better police their waters. So there is a void there and Sea Shepherd is filling that void. I do think what I saw, I've worked with Sea Shepherd and embedded on their ships, you know, multiple times, half dozen times over the last, you know, eight years. Um, seen them in lots of different capacities doing a lot of this different type of work. And I do think they're very professional on how they handle this work. Uh, they they are very careful uh, in respecting the authority uh, and vetting the players that they're collaborating with, you know, sort of which government figures, because governments in all places, my, our country uh, included, are complicated, internally divided, mixed bags, you know. And so you have to be very careful who you're getting in bed with um, when you're doing this kind of work so that you're not partnering with uh, agencies that are involved in maybe questionable stuff. I think that Sea Shepherd is really smart in in being careful about those matters 
And I also, you know, in watching how they do what they do, there is a really legitimate educational and training component. I mean, obviously, Sea Shepherd has self-interest from a PR point of view. And, and part of what they're doing is, is trying to get press and do fundraising around their own NGO and their institution. I don't fault them for that. You know, I'm just trying to be transparent. But at the same time, they are really training the fisheries officers and how do you do proper inspections? What is a, a, you know, kind of a a fishing log? What is a safe way to be boarding ships? All of this stuff. And on board, there were private security officers from Israel, which is another complicated factor, who were actually doing the direct training. They were subcontracted. This firm, this Israeli firm, was subcontracted by Sea Shepherd to do the actual training of the Gambian fisheries officers. Here's how you clean your weapon. Here's how you load it. Here's how you board. Here's where it should be pointed. Here's what you say. Here's what you don't say. Here's where you go. Here's how you secure the ship first before these personnel come on board. All those sorts of things. Here's even how you climb a ladder when you're boarding a ship at sea. You know, these things are not things that um, these officers know because they haven't done it before. So I think all of that is good. The worrisome uh, um, side of this is, you know, at the end of the day, this is an NGO of um, really smart, well-intentioned, fairly experienced, you know, sort of ocean conservationists with a lot of maritime chops underneath them, but they're not law enforcement, right? They don't have the jurisdiction legally to be doing law enforcement And furthermore, they do have the self-interest, which I think they would admit to, of attempting to do uh, engage in certain actions that also bring attention and plaudits to their organization. And what I mean by that is, number one, if they board a ship and a gunfight breaks out, and one of these Sea Shepherd guys or the private maritime security guys end up getting shot or shooting someone, that's really, really complicated as to the rules of engagement and those players being involved in that boarding. Um, So even though they were granted permission by the Gambians to be engaged, if something were to go awry, it could get very complicated uh, geopolitically for the various players involved. I think furthermore, if, and I'm not saying this is the case, but if these things are dog and pony shows, they are meant to be spectacle for the sake of PR, then you can imagine worrisome situations whereby a boarding is rushed and that individual whose ship is being boarded is sort of cast as engaged in illegality when truth be told, maybe they weren't. And all of a sudden, the very culprit, the very villain is actually the victim. And it's part of a victim that comes from this PR exercise, which is doing some area justice in a way that's worrisome. And as a reporter, you're complicit in it because this is a show. This is, um, but actually you're wondering, wait, did that Taiwanese or Chinese captain actually engage in illegality um, or not? And now their career is being ruined and their license being taken away and their crew is sitting in jail when maybe actually they were following exactly the rules that the Gambians gave them. But because this journalist and Sea Shepherd were there and kind of going through this aggressive process and eager to get the press out of it, everything got rushed. And it wasn't actually a fair, legal, ethical engagement. So these are some of the worries that I personally have about these sorts of collaborations. But on the whole, I think that Sea Shepherd is doing great. And the biggest critique, uh, and then I'll shut up, they, sea Shepherd rolls in, partners with these folks, Liberia, Senegal, Gambia, is there for two weeks, two months, whatever, and then they leave. And then the Gambians still don't have the assets, right? They, they still don't have the boats, and they still don't really have the capacity. So all the bad guys who kind of got tipped off and hid out or fled know, okay, it's safe to go back in. And so the question becomes, have you really systematically changed anything in terms of Gambia's relationship with its own waters or not? And I think that's a fair question to ask. Wow. So, okay. Lot to, uh, lot to, uh, unpack there. I mean, I, I definitely appreciate your kind of, I don't, I don't know if I want to say critique, but the problematization of some of the stuff that she, the sea shepherd is doing right. And probably most of our listeners would be most familiar with them. If not from our previous podcast, from their show whale wars, which, you know, is, is entertainment, right? Uh, sure. There's some uh, education uh, going on there too, but it's kind of law enforcement. Well, okay, we won't say law enforcement, in, in fisheries enforcement as spectacle. So certainly I can imagine that 
becomes complicated. And, and I, and I kind of want to follow up and then ask you about the dramatization that, I mean, how dramatic did it feel to be there? I remember reading your essay and you're talking about how these Gambian officers are, you know, maybe it was their first time, but they're jittery. You know, one guy dropped his sunglasses, one guy left his bullhorn behind. Um, and yet at the same time, they've got automatic weapons and Israeli contractors with them. So I really wanted to know what are they afraid of? I mean, it would kind of seem to me that fisheries enforcement would not be a particularly dangerous endeavor, but maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong. Yeah. I mean, I think if, if just empathically you imagine us as those guys, right? What you would be afraid of, what I would be afraid of is looking dumb, right? You've got journalists and you've got your peers and you've got your boss and you've got these sea shepherd guys and you've got these contractors all watching you and you're in uniform and you're carrying a gun and you have the appearance of knowing what you're doing, but you don't, you know, you've never done this before. And so all of a sudden you're doing all this new stuff and you don't want to mess up. So you get nervous. I think it's really at that level. That's a huge part of what made them nervous. It's a lot to keep track of. This is brand new for them and they want to make sure they do it exactly as they were instructed intensely by these Israeli guys to do. Um, and then the way that the education occurs and legitimately is, hey, you need, you're you boarding this ship and you don't know what's going to go down. You might board a ship nine times out of 10 that just has fish on board. But that one time out of 10 could have something else on board. And those guys react in really dangerous ways. Those guys may deck hands on that vessel because they're doing human trafficking or they're moving arms or they've got drugs or what have you. And there all of a sudden you've got like a really scary volatile situation and you don't know whether this is that one time or that nine times. And so you boarding that vessel need to be on your toes and doing things by the book, just in case it's that one volatile time. So those two things, is it the one volatile time? And are these guys going to do something really bad? And am I going to make myself look stupid? You know, like in front of all these people watching, I think those are the two things that make, those guys, the Gambians in this case, nervous. It made me nervous. And I was just there watching, you know. And then I think also you have to move just the sort of, you need to get on and get off pretty quickly because they had the ambition of boarding a lot of ships. And so you've really got to move fast uh, and get through all the steps to do a decent job. And so I think just the time crunch was also something that adds to the stress level. And none of those factors are ones that I blame anyone for. They're sort of just natural. No, I, I can definitely sympathize with that. And it makes me think of, you know, what we did in the military called OJT or on the job training. You know, these guys are both learning, but they're also doing and they're being really scrutinized like you're talking about. So yeah, that, that I think makes a little more sense because I kept wondering, you know, are are these fishing vessels armed ever? Which, I, I mean, I suppose, you know, you can have human trafficking, you can have uh, narcotics trafficking, you could have probably arms trafficking, um, but that's much less likely. And it's, you know, it's more just the kind of environment. And and yeah, I mean, I, I suppose I do feel kind of sympathetic now that I'm, I'm empathizing with these Gambian officers. Yeah, you've got your Israeli uh, trainers, you've got the Sea Shepherd watching you, you've got a journalist watching you, you've got these fishermen, you know, probably everyone else in that equation has more experience in their role than than you might have in yours. And I think, I also think it was really interesting what you said about how the the, the Gambians might view Sea Shepherd as kind of a, a periodic or, or sporadic assistance because that's one of the things that Claude uh, Barry said that that African nations have also complained about U.S. assistance, right? You know, a warship comes in, a Coast Guard vessel comes in, they do great things while they're there, and then they leave. You know, and I'm kind of I'm also reminded of a podcast we did with uh, two researchers from from Stable Seas that you might be familiar with, Kelly Moss and, and Lexi Van Beskirk. And we were talking about uh, more kind of terrorism, but in in Mozambique, and you know, they were really emphatic when I spoke to them that you know, international organizations, other governments can can help. And there's really important pieces of the puzzle that they can provide. You know, you mentioned intelligence, uh, training, uh, platforms. But at the end of the day, the, it has to be the state itself that solves kind of maritime, uh, weak maritime governance and, and has to be able to police its own fisheries. Uh, because when that uh, self-interest isn't there, you know, whether it's on the part of an NGO or, or another government, they may not sh show up. And the only thing I would add to that point, 
which I think is 100% accurate, is that it's important to not forget that all of the problems that you've discussed on this show are ones that the governments, be they local or others, have a huge role to play in solving. But also the market does and the market players and the buyers have a major, they're sort of, they're very easily and they don't suffer this fact. Um, they benefit from it, uh, forgotten in these discussions. And truth be told, all of that fish meal goes someplace. There are buyers, right? And and there are uh, layers of buyers whose names you and I would never recognize. But at some point, they're buy downstream buyers of the cod that ate the fish meal or the shrimp that ate the fish meal or the tuna that ate the fish meal. And those are names that the world knows. You know, these are brand names that... So when you think of that sector of stakeholders who are benefiting and involved in this product and that space, I think it's always important to remember they have a major responsibility too to be involved, not in, you know, Bumblebee of the Sea shouldn't have patrol ships in Gambia. That's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is like journalists like myself should be focusing as much on a critique of the downstream buyers of the fish that eat fish meal and what their supply chain responsibilities are for contributing to better enforcement as should be the U.S. government and the Gambian government. No, that, that makes total sense. And I would think, you know, consumers also need to be and have some awareness of this issue because that's where the fish ultimately goes, right? Whether or not it gets processed in a fish meal or goes and goes to aquaculture and then ends up on the table, you know, it's, it's, it's being eaten by people usually. Um, and I, you know, I don't buy a whole lot of fish, but I can't remember the last time that I went to a, a, a fish market and I was asking, you know, where, where in the world was this caught? You know, I want to know what it is, how fresh it is, but that type of, uh, I don't know if you want to call it consumer awareness, uh, in, in the process, um, I, I think is not always is quite there for fishing. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to try to uh, make up the number or, or remember it off the top of my head. Um, but I think a significant portion of the fish consumed in the United States is is IIU fish, is illegal, unregulated, uh, or unreported fish uh, that makes its way to the United States. And that's I think I believe that was according to the U.S. Coast Guard. Yeah, one in five. One in five fish that ends up on the plate is uh, caught illegally. So then, Ian, we've, we kind of talked about the situation in, in Gambia, and you, and you touched on this a little bit before, but where, how Big, can you give us a sense of the scale? Because that's one of the things that kind of always makes my eyes pop a little bit when I see stuff about IU fishing and 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 fishery depletion. Is what's uh, what scale are we talking about? How big of a market and big of an issue is this? So globally, you're talking about twenty billion dollars worth of fish that is estimated to be in the IUU or illegal, unreported, unregulated space. Roughly, what that breaks down to is, as I mentioned you know, about one in five fish, you know, that gets bought is um, somehow tainted in this way. So it's a huge, huge market and huge number of boats and, and really complicated also because it's not like, oh, there are 100 boats and 20 of them are IUU boats. Uh, you know, it's like yeah, there are 100 boats and 90 of them are involved in partial ways in IUU, meaning some of what they caught was legit, some wasn't. It all gets put on a mothership with a whole bunch of other fish from other boats. 50% of that stuff is legit. The 50% isn't, you know, it's all mixed together. So it's very, very hard to really pinpoint the bad actors. There's some ships that are just like notorious bad actors and they're consistent. Um, but a lot of the, the bad players are hybrid players. And can you give us a sense of where you think this is going? Um, I mean, specifically what you saw in, in Gambia was kind of tied to, the, the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative, but this over-exploitation, do you think it's going to get better? Do you think it's going to get worse? What's what's coming? What's coming down the pipe based on what you've investigated? Are you asking globally or West Africa specific? I, I would ask both, you know, West Africa and, and, and also globally. Globally, I think on sort of where things are heading in the ocean space and specifically with regard not to human rights and labor, but marine concerns. I think it, I honestly can't get my mental helicopter up that high to see that much landscape. Um, 
my impression is that there are a lot of, if you think of this as the war and there are lots of different battles within it, there are a lot of battles that have new troops and new, not to over militarize the metaphor here, but, you know, kind of new technology being used and a lot of promising prospects in the realm of how to better protect the oceans and the people on the oceans and marine life. So, you know, better use of satellite, more, you know, NGO activity and academic activity, making use of satellite and big data to sort of try to get more transparency on what's happening on the water. I think that's happening a lot. More journalistic coverage of that very stuff. That's great, a great sign. The new administration in particular, I think the, the, the former administration had its own set of values and interests and, and those values and interests led it into the space. The America first sort of policy meant China is a clear market and geopolitical adversary and anything we can do in the maritime space that pushes China back fits within that paradigm. The new administration, I think, has a more variables in its outlook on this. And so on the one hand, there is that geopolitical and market, you know, kind of competition with the Chinese and other players, but there's also a more robust set of players and concerns that pertain to climate change and ocean conservation, all the environmental stuff that that has become kind of brought back to life by this administration as major concerns. So I think you're gonna see from a policy perspective, um, more um, action on, you know, the creation of marine protected areas, the funding of more ride-alongs by Coast Guard and Navy in various places in the world to partner with, you know, allied nations to do stuff on the water, more sharing of satellite with countries that, you know, island nations that need help, you know, development aid to, to compete with the Chinese so that the U.S. is getting more of those fish-based contracts or ports or dams or what have you, where the Chinese Belt and Road was sort of more effectively winning the market. So I think you're going to see a lot more scrambling of various ways that have positive outcomes on the ocean. At the same time, I think like the, to be negative um, is to say, you know, 90% of the world's fish, fish stocks are at the point of or past the point of collapse. We're at a really bad place in terms of the health of and the sustainability of how fish are being pulled out of the water. A lot of that is not illegal. It's, in my view, actually, the bigger problem is legalized overfishing, you know, kind of licenses give given to players that are pulling fish at unsustainable rates. And that is a place, you know, turning that policy around on a global level is something that I'm a bit more pessimistic about because it's so huge uh, an issue. I really appreciate kind of your your take on the, the different administrations and, and, and China, because I something I've noticed in looking at, at IUU is it seems to be something that's, it touches all these different parts, right? So I work here in, in US Southcom in, in Colombia, and we've had, you know, our commander, Admiral Fowler, and I've seen also the Coast Guard Commandant, Carl Schultz. They've started harping on IUU, and, and you're probably aware the Coast Guard released a new counter IUU fishing strategy this past year. And one of the things that the Admiral Schultz said when, when he came on the podcast was it's, it's not a counter China strategy, but that's, that's the biggest piece. And it also, you know, is something that uh, people, environmentalists can get excited about. It's something that NGOs can get excited about. Um, and it's also something um, that we've seen increasingly in, in Latin America that some of our, our partners in the region, Ecuador, for example, um, Argentina would be another one that they get, real concerned about IU fishing, you know, and their partners uh, that may not share all of our other geopolitical concerns, but Hey, you know, we, they want to, they want our help. Um, you know, when there's a big Chinese fishing fleet off the Galapagos islands or something like that. So it's, it's interesting for me to see, and, and you brought this out that it's, it's an issue that transcends uh, different presidential administrations and because it's important for different reasons. Yeah, I mean, I think you hit it on the head. I, I think like um, if you do an assessment of why, and it doesn't, politics aside, why a government, the U.S. government, whatever administration, and why sectors within it, be it Coast Guard or Navy, for example, might want to get into the space, you can think of a bunch of reasons. And I think they're at, at work right now. One is, as an institution, the Coast Guard needs to constantly justify its existence, right? It's got to justify 
what its job is, why it deserves budget, you know, et cetera, right? And it is not a leap, in my view, to argue that the Coast Guard and the Navy should be concerned about illegal, you know, unregulated, unreported um, fishing because for a bunch of reasons. One, um, uh, the overlap that those crimes have with other types of crimes, the boring ones, but really consequential document fraud, corruption, bribery to the dramatic ones, sea slavery, murder, arms trafficking, oil dumping, you know, the overlap is well documented and clear, right? So it's, it makes total sense jurisdictionally that these forces would be involved. It also makes sense just from a raison d'etre point of view, if they want to, you know, keep their budget intact and grow it to really make sure that they have good targets, robust targets. And then just from a broader point of view, you know, a place like Gambia has uh, its democratic government start to, to wobble and fall. That has consequences for the whole region, has consequences for U.S. interests, has consequences far beyond the Chinese. Forget who it is who's got those factories there. If that government becomes dictatorial again, it's it's not um, great for U.S. interests. And it's also just from a human interest point of view, ethical human rights point of view, you know, not something we want to be connected with. And so helping see around the corner and see that that's where things might be heading and trying to stop it before it gets that urgent is kind of what we've learned from the Cold War and, you know, U.S. involvement in Latin America. So I think there are lots of self-interested reasons why the U.S. military would have should have growing interest in the space. Well, I can go ahead and tell you that you you are not the first person that has suggested to me that the uh, Navy might want to get interested in in IAU fishing. And I my hunch is that they would not be interested in it. But I think for all the reasons that you've just described, there there is a compelling case, right? I mean, that's part of a full spectrum uh, uh, of competition. And then the the new administration has has started to hype, harp a lot more on environmental and, and climate issues. So those those may justify it in and of themselves. But um, I do want to shift here and, and ask you a little bit about your book, um, The Outlaw Ocean um, and the Greater Outlaw Ocean Project. You know, I've got your book here uh, sitting on my desk. Um, I thought it was, was great. How did you go from, from you know, your, your, what, your, what you were doing before at the New York Times and decide that you want to travel around and do a, a whole project, a series of reporting on, on uh, ocean issues? I mean, so I was, um, there are two things. One, before I joined the Times, I was an anthropologist and I was a cultural anthropologist. And I, I really um, sort of was riveted by the notion of travel and the notion of going to sort of far off lands and seeing stuff I wouldn't otherwise see. You know, um, at root, that's what motivated me. So when I got to the Times and was my mandate was investigative, I always harbored that inclination. I like travel. I like, you know, stories that otherwise were overlooked, I, you know, kind of virgin snow type stuff. I didn't like beat reporting. Secondly, I, I, um, I kind of, so while I was in, before, again, sorry, while I was an anthropologist, I took some time off my doctoral work and went and worked on a ship. And that's when I first got introduced to, this was a, you know, research vessel in Singapore, but, um, I got introduced to this weird world of seafarers, you know, be they long haul fishermen or, you know, merchant marine or whatever in Singapore. And I was riveted by the sort of diaspora transient tribe of people that are these people, largely male, that work this line of work and just how invisible they are and just their whole own world of sense of time and sense of hierarchy and interesting language and their experiences at sea and even their crime, you know, like what they had witnessed and experienced or been involved in. And so I harbored that fundamental curiosity. Then I went to work for the Times and I constantly was scheming some way to possibly get them to allow me to go back into that space. Um, and I also just journalistically thought it was a legitimate topic because there was, you know, virtually no reporting of this sort coming out of that space reported on site at sea, you know, about the diversity of crimes, the diversity of characters out there. And, you know, there was Somali piracy stories and there was BP spill stories and there was ocean plastic stories, but largely that was reported on land and, you know, kind of to an already knowing audience. I wanted to talk about, you know, all this other stuff, illegal whaling and abortion providing and repo men at sea and arms trafficking and murder and sea slavery and just the, the sort of myriad other stuff that happens out there. So and then, uh, you know, did the series, then did the book and then thought I could put it down. And a year after finishing the book, I was like, you know what, there are just too many urgent, insane, amazing stories and too few reporters tackling them 
and I've got six years of doing it. Why am I going to go back to these other topics? Why don't I just double down on this? And so that's what I did. Well, I certainly appreciated uh, your your interest, and I and I think what you were saying, kind of your your curiosity and a little bit of the anthropologist background, comes out in the way that you're talking about. You know, we could call them characters, but the, the people that you're interacting with. I mean, it, it it's a little more, uh, at least from my perspective, is, is a little more rich than just reporting. I mean, you, it, it really um, comes out. So I certainly appreciate that and 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 sympathize that. Yeah, the, the sea is this whole other whole other world. So of the stuff in your in your book, which is, I guess, I think you said in the introduction, it's a little bit more a series of essays. Can you tell us a little more about one or two of them that really stuck out or that or that you thought were particularly, you know, interesting or, or, or powerful? Yeah, I mean, I mean, the, so the book just sort of do the corners of the canvas here and establish parameters. I mean, the book is 15 chapters long, five of them was re-reporting of stuff in the times and then the other 10 were new things and its goal was to broaden the taxonomy to really stretch the the spectrum of what people understood to be happening out there so the the t- topics and the chapters were decidedly meant to be different from their predecessor you know from what came before and what comes after so that when you finished it you were like wow you know this is so diverse and broad and that meant that each chapter was going to be reported in a different place and ideally be topically about a different kind of concern, you know, and set of characters. You know, the let's see how how to, uh, you know, this is a Sophie's choice. I don't have any favorites among my children, but uh, stories that, you know, I don't know, were harder to report and in some ways carried gravitas that the others may not have. I'd say sea slavery as a category of concern, this problem of workers on largely distant water fishing vessels that become captive on the vessels. Maybe they're debt bonded and trafficked onto the vessels, or maybe they're actually Shanghai and kidnapped from a brothel, both of which reported extensively and well-documented. However, they end up there, they're stuck. And sometimes in extreme cases, like one we put on the front of the New York Times, guys are shackled by the neck, you know, like literally stuffed from a pre-Dickensian era you thought was long since gone is still happening. Other times, more often, um, they're just stuck there because they're hundreds of miles from shore. And if they try to escape, they'll be killed. You know, like, um, but you have tens of thousands of boys and men working on a wide variety of vessels, be they Taiwanese or Thai or Cambodian or, or Chinese or South Korean or what have you, that are in this spectrum of sea slavery. And that was a, a really shocking and important chapter that took a huge amount of reporting and really focused on one place where it occurs, South China Sea, and Thai vessels in particular. But really, you can find it in another chapter, you know, off the coast of New Zealand, uh, you can find it off the coast of Ghana, uh, off the coast of the Falklands, you know, you've got like lots of different places. So it's not distinct. That was a chapter and topic that meant a lot of me. And then on the opposite end, you know, shackled guys is pretty dramatic. The opposite end are the sort of less dramatic, but in my view, equally deadly and brutal problem, which is seafarer abandonment. And this is like a slow motion crime, and it's really bad right now with COVID. It largely hits merchant marine, but other types of uh, ship workers. Uh, and it's simply the situation in which a ship ca- you know, owner or you know, insurer or some player that calls the shots on a ship basically decides to cut their losses and walk away from the vessel. Maybe they got hit with an environmental fine they don't want to pay. Uh, Maybe they were sued. Maybe whoever knows. But in any given day, you have hundreds of vessels in this category where essentially overnight, um, the on-land authorities who are making decisions about where that vessel goes and wiring money to keep it in operation just cut their ties. And that vessel basically is stuck. They don't have the fuel to get home. The guys on board don't have the papers to get off and legally travel through the country because they're, you know, non-native and they have no instructions about what they're supposed to do. And um, I've seen this with my own eyes in a bunch of places around the world. And um, these guys sometimes are stuck for over a year, year and a half, no food, no water. They don't, they're just stuck there on this floating cell a mile from shore or a hundred miles from shore. And um they slowly go insane, you know, like it is ultimately what happens in a lot of these cases. They try to escape, they try to swim, they drown. Maybe they make it on land. Now they're undocumented immigrants, but essentially their lives are ruined. And this was a sort of quieter, but brutal crime that 
really captured me in the book and the reporting and and um is is probably the, another is another chapter in the book that that I really cared about frankly wow yeah that's something that I you know wouldn't necessarily come to mind but I think you know especially in the time of covid I can imagine that that's you know more common now or, or uh, unfortunately I'm also reminded of uh, just kind of the whole, from the whole conversation, this concept of, of sea blindness, you know, the idea that we as, a, you know, humans, you know, we live on the land, we're, you know, we have terrestrial societies that we're just kind of blind to what's going on out there. I mean, have you had people co- come to you and with different reaction? What's been the reaction for to some of your pieces? Because I would imagine there's some surprised um, people. I mean, I think like um, the out of sight, out of mind nature of the maritime space, you know, is a real thing. I think um, I'd make a couple points about that. One is we're kind of, we as Western middle-class consumers, if I can be so bold as to put you in that category myself, for sure, like are pretty blind to a lot of the things that we're associated with uh, when it comes to what we consume right? You think of palm oil and iPhones and stuff like that because of the, the sort of globalized nature of how things happen now, vertical supply chains where one company owns each step of the processing uh, don't exist anymore. And now it's all horizontal and there are eight different players and they might even change on a week by week basis. And so this shirt might be dyed in one place and s- stitched in another and cotton from a third. And, you know, and I think so the problem of blindness is really pervasive across all supply chains more now than even 10, 20 years ago. It's really acute in the seafood space for the reasons you cite. The, 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 the vessels that are pulling the water, pulling the fish out of the water are moving. They're owned by a guy in one country and the officers are from another country and the crew are from a third country and they're flagged to a fourth country and they left port in a fifth country and they're dropping it off in a sixth country. And, you know, um, the buyers from a seventh country and the migrant workers. So that's already jurisdictionally and complicated. And then the workers, the deckhands, not the officers are often further invisible because they're very often migrant and undocumented. And so even when they left that country, they got on their Cambodians and they got on a ship in Thailand and now they're off the coast of Somalia. Those guys don't exist, right? Like those Cambodians don't even exist on the books to the Thai authorities that are supposed to be exerting oversight of that ship that's way over there in Somalia, you know? So like the layers of invisibility are intense, you know, and distinct to this workforce in a way that are even different from you know, 13 year old stitching soccer balls in a, in, in a factory in Bangladesh, you know, like, um, uh, so reactions, uh, I don't know. I mean, reactions are all over the map. I mean, I think the, the reactions to the book have that I've liked, <laughs> um, uh, I've been, and that I aimed for were a sense of the stories were great. The reporting was useful, but now I have a broader framework for understanding the all of how all these things fit together uh, in this frontier and the sort of lack of governance and lack of responsibility of other kinds of stakeholders like companies really contributes to all these kinds of crimes. That's where I feel like mission accomplished, you know, like, because I'm getting folks to see the big picture and not just sort of one kind of crime and one evocative story. Where do you think the, the Outlaw Ocean project is going in the future? I mean, I've seen you've been working with some musicians, um, which seems really interesting. So what, you know, and I assume you're going to keep doing investigative reporting. Where's the project going? Yeah. So, I mean, um, it has become this duck billed platypus, this weird creature, you know, it doesn't really fit in any kind of category. I left the times, um, I, which meant I was previously on staff, had a salary, et cetera, but I could only write for them. And I thought, I want to start producing content for them, but a bunch of other people too. If I'm going to have impact, I want to start publishing in Le Monde Diplomatique and Der Spiegel and Australian Age and BBC and you know all these other players, Netflix. And so how can I do that? Well, I moved over to contract writer, lost my salary, um, created my own nonprofit outfit. You know, that's essentially me and five other people that run this um, thing called the Outlaw Ocean Project. Our mission is to produce these kinds of stories 
under this umbrella topically, methodologically distinct in the sense that they're always reported to some degree on the water. We don't report on shore and we sort of pick our stories very carefully. We're not into, we're not beat reporters that are on the ocean beat. That's not what we do. And then we take the stories always starting with a written, you know, kind of foundation, 5,000 word story, 1500 word story, whatever. And then we publish it in a starting venue, the New Yorker, the Washington Post, what have you. And then we take that same story, translate it into a bunch of other languages, French, German, Spanish, Arabic, Chinese, have partners in 40 different countries, usually the tier one venue in those countries, say, hey, look, we're going to give you the story for free. You don't have to pay for it. We want the audience, not your money. Uh, we have our own set, and I'll talk about the finances, but, and then that's how we get reach. So a story that might only get a million readers in the Times gets 20 million readers because we've done this whole huge play, which is breaking the mold on copyright and exclusivity and took a lot of work to get, but is kind of a game changer in terms of the impact of the journalism. And then, then the other thing we do with the stories is we try to convert them into other things. So the reporting um, then isn't just left there in the publications in, in written word, but rather it we actively try to recruit folks like you in podcast realm because a lot of people are consuming really interesting, good journalism in podcasts. So we bring the stories over to people like you and and try to partner and and talk about the issues. We bring the stories over to animators and have them do animated series on Instagram over to Netflix and pitch them on, you know, series, you know, um, based on one line of reporting. And then we have this music project, which is really weird and really exciting, which is essentially kind of what Lin-Manuel Miranda did with Hamilton, where essentially you took a body of research on Hamilton and you teamed up with musicians, in our case, electronic, classical, hip hop, ambient, and said, would you use some of the sounds from the five years of video footage, you know, rich textured sounds, machine gun fire in Somalia or chanting Cambodian deckhands. And would you read the book and make an album? And then would you allow us to publish the album? We'll pair it with video footage and we'll essentially commandeer platforms like Spotify and Pandora and whatnot and turn them into journalistic platforms where we'll play your music, but we'll also get people to see the footage and maybe even read the article. And that was a sort of play to get at younger demographics who consume information in music platforms. But we rather than trying to get them to come read the New York Times, why don't we go to them, you know, in, in delivery service, if you will. And so that's uh, now we have 475 artists from 80 countries, 90 million listeners who listen to the music and a good portion of that traffic comes over and reads the articles. Um, and that's sort of the music project. Wow. I, I would not have, uh, I would not have guessed. Okay. <laughs> I, I thought I did a little background research, but that, but that's a lot. I was, I was not aware of all that. No. And it, I mean, it definitely strikes me now as more of a, 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 a you said a not profit. It's kind of focused on these issues and raising awareness and, and getting the word out and journalism is part of how you're doing that more than a purely journalistic enterprise. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think like we try to stop short of crossing into advocacy, like our advocacy is read the journalism, but we don't promote specific policies or, or, or whatnot. And what we've tried to do, my view is there's a lot of really amazing stuff happening in the, in journalism when it comes to storytelling, but there hasn't been as much innovation in distribution. And how do you get at different types of audiences and get them to consume journalism? That is an anemic realm. And, and that's where we really put our focus was, let's do some daring. Th- we already know how to do the journalism pretty well. So, but let's do some really daring creative things with how we get that story out to different kinds of readers or viewers or listeners. And uh, that's, that's one of the key things that we do with the um, with the Outlaw Ocean Music Project. And I would have to say the the music is kind of weird, but it's it's like a good you know kind of a cool good weird. There's some there's some groovy beats <laughs> groovy beats out there that I was listening to recently. Well, thank you, Ian, for for coming on the podcast again. I'd, I'd like to thank my guest, Ian Urbina, a prize winning jur- investigative journalist and author of The Outlaw Ocean. Uh, before we go, you know, give you the opportunity to kind of finish up with some final thoughts. Um, but then we also always uh, want to ask, you know, what are you working on right now, obviously within the the project um, and, and what's the best 
place for our listeners to, to find you online. Yeah. I mean, I'll go to that. I think I've long windedly said everything you, you need to hear already and maybe even too much. Um, uh, there are two main platforms. There's the outlawocean.com and that's the journalism project and purely journalism. And then there's the outlawoceanmusic.com and that's its offspring, you know, music project. Obviously they're part of the same endeavor and the music funds, just listening to the music, the streaming revenue goes towards funding more journalism. So um, it's got a sort of cause behind it. And you go to either site on the journalism front, a lot of what keeps us in business is individual subscribers, you know, five bucks a month for the direct newsletter. And we have subscribers who just get the stories uh, each month. We put out a, a, you know, about a story per month or month and a half. Yeah. And, and topically, what am I working on now? Uh, doing a lot on the, the, the world calamari market and squid vessels and quite especially the Chinese the huge fleet that we discovered largest IU fleet ever discovered in North Korean waters about, you know, 900 vessels every year going into those waters and put out a story, a big year long investigation went on the water for that, obviously um, uh, in um, NBC news and then everywhere else that's on the website, but we built on that. And now we're looking at the other big pockets of Chinese vessels, including the one you mentioned, which is like 350 squid vessels, Chinese that every year go to the Falklands and then over the Galapagos and then to Montevideo and doing a deep investigation of that fleet and um, some really dark concerns about not just their IUU behavior, but some um, pretty shocking human rights things happening on their ships. So that's a big priority. Seabed mining, ocean plastic, kind of working on, but waiting for, you know, a way into those stories that feels evocative and narrative, having cracked the code on those, but I'm aiming at them. Um, and then also doing a piece, uh, just got back from an embed on the Mediterranean with uh, Red Cross on a, on these bunch of COVID ships, quarantine ships, about 10,000 migrants being held at sea and um, headed to Libya, Tunisia, and Niger as part of that same reporting to look at how migrants are being handled as they attempt to get across Africa and cross those waters and sort of, you know, just the illegality and brutality of, of that whole process. Those are our targets. Wow, that is uh, that is quite quite a lot. Uh, we're looking forward to that, um, and we may have to invite you back on and talk about some of those other issues. And we'll make sure that we put uh, links to uh, to the project below the the podcast, so our listeners can find it online. Thanks for coming on. Again, the opinions presented on this podcast are solely our own and, and should not be taken as representative of any of the institutions that we're associated with. Thank you again for joining me and to our listeners. Thanks for tuning in and we'll see you next week. Sea Control is produced and edited by Ed Salo, William McQuiston, and Jonathan Selling. I want to tell the final counter. Well.